For many years, I hosted uh, What Matters to Me and Why, so this is like a homecoming for me. It's really nice to be back in this space. And this program always meant a lot to me because it creates a space on our campus to have conversations about what it means to be human, about who we are, our hopes and dreams, our challenges, our aspirations, how we connect with one another, how we find meaning and purpose. And every presenter brings their own perspective into the larger conversation of what matters to me and why. Um, that we've been doing this for more than 20 years, I think, so it's really become a signature program here at USC. Uh, and we're really lucky to have Professor Karen Tongson um, end us uh, this semester uh, um, uh, today. Um, we have a uh, What Matters uh, to Me and Why slate up for next semester. We have four more extraordinary speakers. We do this every month, generally the first Wednesday of the month, and we serve a free meal. So please continue to come, sign up for the newsletter, and uh, bring a friend uh, next time. Uh, and yeah, there are maybe a few seats up here. It's not class, so no one gets called on <laughs> unless you want to. Uh, after, uh, after the presentation, we'll be doing a Q&A. Please ask your question into the mic. Uh, someone will be running around a wireless mic so we can get it on camera. Uh, before I introduce uh, our, the, pres uh, the person who will introduce our presenter today, I just want to let everyone know about an event we're doing this evening. As many of you know, it's been a really difficult semester on campus. It's been quite tragic. Uh, we've had a number of deaths uh, that have really devastated us, um, and left us heartbroken, and left us uh, really mourning. And t tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to come together at 7 p.m. at the Fishbowl at the University Religious Center. And the Interfaith Council is going to host a moment of remembrance, where we remember those we lost. We offer prayers from the world's faith traditions. We light candles, and we just spend some time together. So um, please join us if you can tonight at 7 p.m. at the Fishbowl. One of the things that makes What Matters to Me and Why so special is that uh, we ask someone who has uh, been transformed by our presenters to introduce our presenter, um, because our presenter is what matters to them. And today, I'm very grateful for the presence of Professor Chris Belker, who uh, will introduce Karen. So thank you for being here. She uh, teaches in the writing program. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Chris Belcher. I'm a lecturer in the writing program at USC. And I teach primarily in the thematics of identity and diversity. So if any of you have taken Writing 150, you might have been in that thematic before. Um, I'm a scholar of, of queer studies, like Professor Tongson, and also a writer of creative nonfiction. Um, I did my doctoral degree here at USC, and Professor Tongson was my advisor. Um, so I'm actually going to read you just a few lines from her first book um, that really exemplify why I wanted to work with her um, as, a, as a scholar and as a teacher. It's from a chapter titled Empire of My Familiar, and it's about the Inland Empire. Uh, Professor Tonkson writes, that new sensation of stability, that first taste of an American dream I would spend my entire academic life learning to understand, only to eschew, inevitably gave way to adolescent yearnings for something else, to elsewhere befitting queer of color consciousness animated by all of those evenings spent alone in my room, taping pop songs off the radio. Remote intimacies were in formation. So that, that concept that she brings up here in the section of remote intimacies, it becomes central to her theory of queer suburban life, which she's trying to work on in this book. Um, thinking about how different subjects across different times and different spaces can become intimate through practices that she remembers actually from her adolescence, like taping pop songs off the radio. And in this short section, um, what I think you can see is how Tonkson uses her own life experience as the subject for her queer studies. As for me, um, I showed up to academic life as a first-generation college student. Um, I got to USC with a really bad case of imposter syndrome, and I felt like all of my peers had outread me by leaps and bounds. But um, Professor Tonkson's work and her teaching really showed me that writers living queer lives, um, as writers living queer lives, our experiences were really rife for exploration. Um, and it made me really see that 
the lives of the communities around us that we move through every day were really the things that I wanted to write about. So as a first gen student who never felt that I particularly felt that fit into the institution that my peers seemed to move through with ease, um, the idea that I actually had a wealth of knowledge in my experience really helped me uh, push through that imposter syndrome and once I graduated, finally put it behind me. So, Karen Tonkson is the author of Why Karen Carpenter Matters um, and Relocations Queer Suburban Imaginaries. In 2019, she received the Lambda Literary Jean Cordova Award for Lesbian and Queer Nonfiction. She is Associate Professor of English, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and American Studies and Ethnicity here at USC. And she's a co-editor of the award-winning book series Postmillennial Pop with Hen Henry Jenkins at NYU. She has two books in progress. Um, one is titled Empty Orchestra, Karaoke, Queer Aesthetics, Queer Theory from Duke University Press, and Norm Porn, Television and the Spectacle of Normalcy from the NYU Press. Um, previously, she was a panelist on MaximumFun.org's Pop Rocket podcast, and she now co-hosts Waiting to Exhale with Winter R Mitchell Rohrbach, um, and you can find her on Twitter at Inland Emperor. So, thank you, Karen Tonkson. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Professor Tongson, uh, and uh, thank you, Chris, for that warm and lovely introduction, Dr. Belcher, um, uh, who, you know, it, it's such a gratifying thing. I've been teaching now at USC for 15 years. It's amazing how quickly that time goes by, and it's just such a pleasure to be, you know, reminded of the brilliant and amazing students who have had the opportunity to work with who've taught me as much as I've taught them, and Chris, Dr. Belcher is certainly one of those people. So um, what matters to me and why? You see that um, in, my, in my introduction, uh, my latest book is called Why Karen Carpenter Matters. So that kind of overlaps a little bit with the title and the structure of this series of what matters to us. I'm not gonna be talking specifically about Karen Carpenter, but I do want to talk about uh, what matters to me and how I got over the fact that it didn't matter as much to a lot of other people, and how that was the formation of my scholarly life, essentially. Um, so as you might have picked up on from Chris's introduction, and also from the book titles that she named, uh, the research that I do, popular culture matters a lot to me, popular music in particular. And in academia, as you probably know, as young scholars yourselves, uh, also based on many of the classes that you take here, pop culture is looked at uh, with some suspicion as an object of study, uh, especially because, you know, it's uh, entertainment for the masses because, as people say about popular culture, it often documents the lowest common denominator of life, et cetera. But as I teach in my intro to US pop culture class in American studies, and as I hope my range of research throughout this time has demonstrated, pop culture as the objects of our everyday lives, as the things that we turn to to nurture our loneliness if we feel isolated, the things that connect us to other people when we come into a new context or culture, pop culture is that thing that is not only the kind of emotional connective glue, but it also is the way that we learn about the world and worlds that we may be unfamiliar with. So I immigrated to the US when I was uh, basically twice, five years old and 10 years old. Uh, the first time that I came to the United States, uh, I was four going on five and I moved to Honolulu, Hawaii. And the only con context or concept I ever had about what the United States was from far away, I was born in the Philippines, was whatever I saw on TV. So in the 70s, that was shows like Chips, about the California Highway Patrol, Charlie's Angels, which was recently rebooted and failed miserably at the box office, and you know certain other things that I, Little Love Boat, certain other things that I'd encountered on TV at that time. And I always tell this story because it's such a weird one um, in that I was convinced that when I moved to the United States, somehow my hair would mysteriously and magically turn blonde. 
like that I would become a blonde person because that's what I noticed or saw on all of this American television, uh, you know, like Julie from The Love Boat uh, and certainly Farrah Fawcett on uh, Charlie's Angels. So, uh, you know, obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> I was five. I wasn't like, hey, get me a bottle of that, you know, hair dye mom from the grocery store or the drugstore. But it was, it taught that moment, that moment of recognition or lack of recognition allowed me to see how powerfully pop culture shapes our sense of what we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to look and how we're supposed to turn out. And that if we looked more closely at that, and if we looked at it not with a lens of moralism that says pop culture in general is bad, or just think, think about it as you know this kind of useless um, diversion from the everyday and the real and what we care about, then uh, I think that we can come up with certain answers to ourselves about why we feel a certain way, why we are politically inclined in certain ways, why uh, we want certain things, certain worlds to come to fruition over others. And so that's really a big part of uh, my interest in it. But it's also fun, right? I think one of the things that came out in the, the passage that Chris read from my first book, Relocations, is that uh, you know, listening to music in particular was a way for me to imagine being in community with people who I hadn't met yet. And I don't know how many of you have had that sort of experience where, you know, you listen to a song uh, and then maybe a few years later you hear that song again and you think about all the different ways, all, maybe the different people who you used to listen to that song with, but also you maybe you meet somebody in like a new context when you get to college outside of high school and by some happy accident a song comes up comes on the radio and you hear it together and you're like god i love that song it makes me think of this and the other person says yeah me too it makes me think of this and what you have there is the kind of instant glue a connective tissue forged through popular music through um the experiences that we have filtered through that wonderful radiant thing that meant so much to us that sticks in our heads uh you know in our moments uh, of both despair and joy and so that's one of the reasons too that i'm very invested in and interested in pop culture um and so obviously you know the pathway to you know becoming a scholar of pop culture isn't one that's very easily determined, right? Uh, there are a few pop culture studies programs out there in the world. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that uh, I turned to right away as a college student was literature. So I, got, I received my bachelor's degree in English and my PhD in English. And uh, of course, we have to know that a lot of literature, especially in the period of literature that I was interested in in the 1800s, much of that literature, many of those novels were themselves part of pop culture in their different cultural contexts. Dickens, uh, we think of as a venerable writer or figure now, but you know, that was what the popular, uh, he was a popular writer, right? He was a, very, a best selling author and someone that the rabble could read and get into in, 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 in their own way. And also, of course, obviously that argument's been made about the theater that Shakespeare wrote uh, much earlier. Uh, in the early modern period. So literature also became this kind of conduit for me to begin to understand culture more broadly and to put together those interests in the things that I was studying uh, and the things that I was consuming on my own in, uh, in my spare time. So I like to read, I like to listen to music, uh, and those things coalesced in the study of English for me at the time. Uh, and then, you know, I ended up pursuing my doctoral studies in that. In fact, my PhD is not on popular culture, even though when I applied to grad school, I said I wanted to work on it. I ended up writing a dissertation on Victorian literature, of all things. But as, you know, if any of you have studied any of those periods or that literature, you'll know that so much of what I'm talking about, formations of culture, um, is, is rooted in that period uh, of time. And it's strange to me to look back now on certain key moments. I think that for many of you, a lot of your life moments as a younger person are probably documented on video, uh, you know, in cell phone footage, cameras, et cetera. 
Uh, I graduated from high school in 1991, so that's almost 28 years ago, I think, or nine, 29 years ago. Jesus. Okay, uh, 28. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, there's a video of me in high school talking about what I plan to do, and I'm impressed at once by the absolute naivete and hubris of my declarations at that moment. Because I think it's also important to be accommodating to ourselves uh, throughout our, our educational journeys, the arcs that we take to becoming who we are. So on my high school graduation day, my dad holding the wobbly video, giant video camera, uh, you know, I hear there are people who come up to me to ask what I'm about to, what I'm gonna be doing next. I went to a working class high school in Riverside, California. Didn't go to a fancy prep school. I got a D in geometry because I hated math and I wasn't very good at it and I used to always skip the class. Um, although I was good at literature and, and the arts and theater and all those things. So I had a decent grade point average but um, I didn't even know how to wrap my mind around applying for college. So I said, but in my mind I knew where I wanted to go. So I said, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna stick around, I'm gonna go to Riverside Community College for a couple of years, which a lot of people from my high school did, and then I'm gonna go to UCLA, which I did end up doing two years later, and I said, maybe, you know, I, I might get, like, you know, go to grad school, get a PhD at Berkeley, and, which I ended up doing, like, a decade later. And I'm shocked that I said those things in that moment, as I said, of naivete, a certain level of cluelessness at how hard each of those steps were going to be. And then uh, also a sense of hubris because since I didn't know how hard they were going to be, I just was like, yeah, I'm gonna do all this stuff. And so I encourage all of you to kind of think about those moments of fearlessness that you've enacted and acted upon in your lives. Uh, especially now when you have the opportunity at university to explore different ideas, different things, at the same time that you're pursuing certain goals that you're doggedly attached to. And so, you know, what matters to me is that um, we listen to that part of ourselves that has that kind of bravado, that it understands a certain kind of, um, that, that reaches for a set of dreams that may seem uh, to others listening with rationality <laughs> in their minds that that might be a bit harder than you think, kid. And, uh, you know, and honestly, the path wasn't uh, necessarily a pleasant one the whole time, but it's, it's one that I'm very pleased to have gotten in my head and done uh, in that, in across that period of time. And so even now, 15 years as a college professor here at USC, um, you know, there are times that I remind myself of that moment that I decided to not just um, surrender to the outsiderhood of my status, but figured out a way to make what I did, uh, you know, basically uh, lead to this world, this life that was important to me. So that's, you know, a set of different clusters of stories and anecdotes that uh, I have about how I pursued those things that mattered to me and why they mattered to me. Um, when earlier I talked about popular music as, you know, one of the conduits to um, different and profound moments in our lives, something that teaches us about our lives. And I said that, you know, those songs in your head, they'll stick with you forever. They'll be the reason that you make connections to uh, and the kinds of connections that turn out into lifelong friendships, relationships, loves, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and I think that even at the very end, when I saw, I, I've spent time with my grandmother who was very dear to me, and even at the very end, uh, the day that she passed away, she couldn't really talk anymore, but I put on her favorite music, and she smiled, and she heard it. So remember to listen to that music and hold it very close to you. I don't know why I got so emotional just then while I'm talking about death, of course. But, but that's, that's what I mean. It's like feel what you're into, go with it, ride that feeling, and, you know, and it will lead you to beautiful places and in inspiration and connection in your life. So I guess that's where I'll end with my spiel since we've only got about 15 minutes or 20 minutes more to talk. 
And I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have about anything I've said, about what my favorite songs are or not, about uh, anything related to pop culture that you may have always wanted to know but didn't have an answer for, or basically anything else that you know I may have expertise to share with you. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your your words and your reflections. Um, a question that I had is um, uh, just personally, I'm uh, I, I follow uh, a number of uh, different pop culture people and individuals. Uh -huh. And one thing that I uh, that has come into the rise and greater attention is, is individuals like Billy Porter and um, uh, Jonathan Van Zandt and a number of people that are just um, individuals of all different shapes and sizes that are using their pop culture platform, um, expressing themselves in, in different ways and really kind of uh, pushing and, and expanding the conversation of gender and expression and even just, um, there's even a greater conversation about um, uh, identity and, and of those type of things. So uh, I, my, my thought or my question to you is just mm -hmm. in relationship to pop culture, what do you think uh, the connection is between kind of represent rep pop culture individuals pushing um, conversations around identity, around gender expression, around, around greater um, diversity of that? Um, but but because they're pop culture, um, like for example, Jonathan Van, Van Zandt, he was recently mm -hmm. on the cover of Cosmopolitan mm -hmm. uh, UK, and people were talking about like this very pop culture um, entity and magazine, and about how he was the first, uh, or he one of the few males to be uh, identified on um, the cover. So just. Uh, can you speak a little bit about pop culture and this kind of intersection between pop culture individuals pushing greater mm. narratives about identity? Yeah, I think that one of the things that's been, and one of the things that's a kind of through line historically in what I teach about, especially in US popular culture, is how people who had the access and capacity to tell stories and to perform in those stories uh, helped redefine or bring to the fore social issues that were percolating in the historical moment that they were in. So for example, uh, one of the earliest uh, texts that I teach, texts, TV shows is Star Trek and the very first interracial kiss shown on television in 1968, which was in uh, just a, a couple of years after Loving versus Virginia, the Supreme Court case that uh, basically allowed for uh, you know uh, marriages across uh, in interracial marriages, and so you know it, it wasn't that long ago, right? And we could think about how um, it wasn't that scene on Star Trek, which had its own problems with the way that it was framed and blocked, and whatever. Um, it wasn't just Nichelle Nichols' presence on that show that that had an effect on racial relations in the United States. Maybe it didn't have much at all. So the representation itself did, wasn't, and the star themselves wasn't the thing that transformed it. But if you can be a part of and a participant in the broader cultural conversation and to push, as you're saying, that conversation in certain directions with the platforms and conduits you have, it creates the possibility for change, the possibility to um, affect hearts and minds and do those things. Of course, you know, sometimes we put those images out there and they, they, they have deleterious or negative effects, but the main thing is to um, push ourselves to tell as many different stories about different people as possible and not to reproduce uh, certain ideals of who you're supposed to be, what the world expects of you necessarily on those shows. And I think that modeling that is, is exciting. And I think that increasingly there are opportunities and more, more platforms, different platforms. You don't just have to be on TV anymore. You can find different platforms of expression to share uh, your message to transform the conversation. Um, but you know, I think that, that what it takes is for people to really kind of push their way in there and to also say, if, if we find ourselves seeing the same story repeated over and over again with only the same people, for those of us who find ourselves not seen to speak up in response to that, to say, wait a minute, you know, like, um, this is ridiculous. You're not, um, you know, that, this, this, that you're only telling this story. And we've seen this story 
repeat like uh, over a dozen times in the last however many years. Let's let's change that narrative. Let's put new stories out there. So that's also why I encourage your humanistic inquiry uh, as scholars, as students. Other questions or comments? Hello, thank you for that talk. Um, my question is about uh, the best TV show that there is right now. Oh. So NFL football. So um, from you experience, NFL football. So uh -huh. like that's that's literally okay. what everybody's watching, you know, uh, every Sunday and stuff like that. So from experience, I can tell you that football does. I play football in high school, so that does take a toll on you emotionally and physically over time. Um, my question is more along the lines of of Colin Kaepernick and how he wants to. Oh, he's not. He doesn't want to, but he's he he has a, a no choice but to take a uh, action in, in in his world and you know and do do nothing but reflect it, uh, upon his um, right to you know take a knee. Um, I, I guess my question is, well, how can you kind of uh, find the middle of the middle ground between um, doing what you love in a sport and I guess in in life in general, being whatever field you're in, how can you find the the the, the place to be to do what you want to do and what you love and, and make a message um, come across as the right way, you know. Mm -hmm. So how do you do the right thing? Yeah. Um, or how do you decide to do the right thing, like, in more broadly while confronting the possibility that it may affect your future, your career, these different things? How do you find a way to do both without, like, losing one or the other? Is that kind of what you're asking? Okay. No, it's so great because actually my students in my Intro to U.S. Pop Culture class just did a presentation on Colin, uh, Colin Kaepernick, which was really fantastic. So, um, eh, But also one of the things that was a kind of subject of, the, of discussion there is, you know, uh, the many debates about, um, you know, when we put ourselves at risk to, to do the right thing, to tell the truth, that kind of thing. And it's a complicated question because... For some people, um, maybe you know, even somebody like Kaepernick, who made millions of dollars as a quarterback in the NFL for a period of time, you know, taking his stand and being able to use his platform didn't mean that he would instantly fall into penury or poverty uh, with that single gesture, right? Whereas those f people who work in fields that are not as richly rewarded uh, still face similar issues that they want to confront, but struggle more with the idea of like, how do I do this? How do I stand up to uh, th what I see is going on that's wrong without, you know, putting my entire family, my entire world at risk by potentially losing this job? I mean, that's a difficult question and it's one that, you know, I think um, people have had to grapple with or face, but I think that in the times that we live in and in the world that we live in, as we begin to see how much people can get away with other people's silence in so many different circumstances. I'm thinking also if we move away from the world of football but also into the world of entertainment uh, and, 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 and in other fields, the kind of Me Too movement, right? Um, that at some point, the only way to stop and reroute and change the, the, de the deleterious effects of and the direct bad directions that our industries our uh, you know, institutions are making is to stand up and say something. And yes, we put everything at risk, um, but it's also to build a coalition and build a community that can hold you and take care of you in that space when you do do that. And so I think that that's one of the things too, it's just we have to s see ourselves less as individuals who need to take that stand. It made a difference when other athletes uh, in the NFL or when Megan Rapino or others began to take that stand with Colin Kaepernick because if he had just been the only person who do the, to do that himself, it may have been all for naught um, and kind of buried in a story about an individual, but as a movement, as something that um, people uh, join forces for as a coalition, it was more effective. Yeah. That's, that's what I encourage people to kind of consider too, is when it's time to take that stand, time to do that work, uh, you build your coalitions and you stand together in those situations. Hi, thank you so much for sharing. Um, the title of one of your books really got my attention and mm -hmm. I made so many ideas of what I thought it might be. Uh -huh. And I looked it up and it was not, I think it was Norm Porn, was uh -huh. it? 
Um, could you talk a little about what it's about? Yeah, sure. So this concept, and it's pr a provocative word, norm porn. And it is like, it's a concept of basically the kind of TV we watch um, for comfort, <laughs> like a kind of super normy, cozy, uh, no, by normy, I mean things that don't really um, challenge the status quo around race, gender, or sexuality. Um, those, those narratives that are kind of wholesome, almost family narratives that we look at. Um, like par the show Parenthood or Gilmore Girls or um, let's see what some of the other shows, a show called 30 something that was out in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so what I look at is the, the kind of arc of these shows, these shows where everybody seems so um, almost happy to the, or, and kind of connected as a family to the point that it's, it's supposed to be realism but it becomes unrealistic, right? And I think about that in relation to what it means for uh, audience members who are not of those worlds and largely LGBT people who, uh, and people of color who look from the outside in at those wor worlds and who use those shows um, as a way of basically, I don't know, um, as a mode of identification, as a point of disidentification, as a point of um, releasing one's emotions about, around the schmaltziness of what's represented there. So the, the porny part, the release of the porny part of that is really about um, you know, the tears that we shed when we watch these shows. Uh, even ads for those shows, a show like This Is Us, for example, is, is something that is in the vein of this historical arc of shows that all emerged around a particular time when we thought the whole world was going to um, be just accommodating and post-racial and fuzzy and warm, et cetera. So that's sort of what that, that project is about. Any other questions or comments? Who watches This Is Us here? Let me just ask. How many people here watch that show? Anybody? few people like I've come to find a lot of people don't watch a lot of a lot of college students don't watch a lot of television so that this uh, so I have to assign shows it's like you have to watch this because you need to know what's going on there in addition to the critical literature that I have them read yeah. do you all just watch YouTube now or just like scroll through TikTok is that what happens I just, I'm legit legitimately curious, or you're just busy hitting the books and reading, and working hard, going to the gym, <laughs> Netflix. Oh, see that, you don't count that as television, Netflix? Okay. I mean, yeah, there's Netflix, the movies, binges. That's kind of amazing. Yeah, I know. I mean, I watched all of The Crown, I think, in one day. Oh. I was sick, though. I was in bed sick. And I was just like, okay, this is the only chance I'm going to get to do it, so I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. That's what a lot of media scholars have argued, right, are arguing about is the extent to it, you know, how, what are the boundaries of a TV show or a show like Shrill on Hulu, which is only six episodes and the episodes were about 20 to 30 minutes each. And so you could kind of watch them all strung together like a movie, right? Um, it's about the length of that. I think that, you know, um, what defines television is production, Right, so the kind of the kind of production it is, the kind of people staff to do it, and also just the amount of mo money who's distributing it. Um, it the, it's it's almost a kind of um, arcane way of deciding. It's like, well, this is being produced by, this is being created by uh, people it, using TV standards, right? Something like The Crown, it's you know, or Game of Thrones. Those are expensive TV shows, but um, streaming itself is you know. Uh, also, like the length of each episode, the episodic nature of it certainly defines it. But streaming itself, just because you can see everything at once, doesn't mean it's not 
television, right? It's not part. It's not art, um, part of the architecture of writing episodically or in those ways or as single episode units. So, I mean, it's definitely under debate. But and the fact that we can see things on so many different screens at any different moment, you know, it was like pulled up to get gas and there's like a TV like blaring at me while I'm pumping gas. I'm just like, there is no space away, you know. Yes. The since it's your your field is popular culture, what mm -hmm. you think the sort of what the baby Yoda in the Mandalorian <laughs> means to today's society, or why so many people are invested in this creature? Uh, why specifically baby Yoda? <laughs> I mean, well, I think that it's first of all something that in you know that sh shared across the popular culture is rare now like you know it's monoculture right we is what we used to kind of pop culture used to be the thing that everybody saw and what, one of the rare things that people see now is the super bowl right or big event things like that not everybody watches the same shows anymore we're all narrow cast we're all binging different things last holiday season it was like the whole bird box thing right everybody seemed to have watched that whole thing and was you know and it, it was memefied and that kind of thing. I mean, in terms of why Baby Yoda specifically, I think, captured people's imaginations, um, one is that we cannot resist baby versions of anything Muppet related or, or anything related, right? We love the idea of seeing something brought back to its form of innocence. Uh, number two, uh, it's that obviously Star Wars has been part of a broader cultural mythology in the US for a while. And I think that one would be hard pressed to not know who Yoda was in general across multiple generations. And the fact that there's this, you know, um, kind of newer origin story or iteration for it is like captivating to us. We're so into origin stories now um, in, in terms of like the superhero stuff, especially, but um, we like to know the genealogy or genesis of something. So that I think captures people's attention. Also, Baby Yoda, even if you don't have Disney Plus, I don't have Disney Plus. I haven't seen Mandalorian. But, you know, the picture is circulating uh, across so many social media platforms, right? And, so, and it's become memefied. So its spreadability is also, you know, because it's a common cultural reference that's shared globally, as well as in the U.S., obviously, um, you know, that, that, that spreadability of it, it, it helps uh, turn it into a phenomenon. Also, just, you know, it's like it's little Yoda with a teacup is cute, right? <laughs> and I think that, I, I mean, I don't know, is anybody here is just like, whatever about Baby Yoda? Okay, a couple people just like, yeah, whatever. But a majority of people, it's, it's hard not to like be like, oh, when you look at it. Or, whoa, you know. Yeah, those are real scholarly responses. Oh, whoa. The Keanu Reeves school of pop culture. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, sorry, me again. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, do you have any comments on whether you think political, like pop culture has more um, influence over political culture now, like shows like Handmaid's Tale or like celebrities endorsing presidential candidates and things of that nature? I think that pop culture has always intersected with U.S. political life. Um, I was just at the Smithsonian recently, and I saw all the different ways in which, even in the 19th century, you have uh, different popular political, um, uh, excuse me, pop cultural figures uh, endorse or are you know bleed into the political life of those campaigns from early, early on. Uh, but I do think that w you know in more recent election cycles, there has been uh, a considerable overlap between the structures we become familiar with in entertainment and the structures of our political life and our governance. I think that it's no, I think that the fact that uh, our president was a former reality uh, show host uh, and star means, and to a certain extent, that we view the events that unfold in relation to him as a figure, as a kind of game show, or as a kind of reality show, or as a kind of contest, a reality competition, that um, even wherever we fall on the political spectrum, whatever our attachment is, or dislike, or whatever, uh, you know, admiration, whatever it is for 
um, the the president is that we can't dissociate from that that set of associations that we have through reality competition through uh, TV to getting used to the idea of, you know like the, the revolving door of like you're fired right they a lot of staffers fired um, it's become almost difficult to tell the difference between reality and reality as a genre and I think that that's sort of a uh, crisis that all of us that a lot of media scholars but many of us as just people existing in our contemporary culture are grappling with today we are out of time uh, thank you all for spending this hour with me and I hope you all have a great holiday season and uh, yeah enjoy your winter breaks and thank you to uh, the entire like staff responsible for this and to my, uh, Vanessa Gomez-Brake who invited me to come here. All right, thank you.